Hello and welcome to another edition of What Does the Giraffe Say Media with me, Kathleen Rotorne. We're an organisation that aims to connect people in conservation by holding live interviews on social media. Today, I'm very happy. We are joined by Dr. Gladys, and she is the founder of Conservation Through Public Health. And we're going to be talking all about the work that she does. So Gladys, if I could hand over to you, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in conservation and why gorillas. Thank you so much for inviting me, Kathleen, to your exciting show. I'm a wildlife veterinarian and conservationist. I got involved in conservation from a very young age. Actually, if I go all the way back, uh, we had a, there was a pet monkey that our next door neighbor had that used to like coming home and one time played the piano. So I was very fascinated by how intelligent monkeys can be. He also did very mischievous things like pulling the cats and dogs tails mm -hmm. and stealing fruit from the kitchen. But that was my first introduction to a different kind of animal. I grew up with lots of animals at home and I always wanted to be a vet, but when the monkey came in my life, I thought, well, I could also be a vet for other species as well. And then a few years later, I set up a wildlife club at my high school in Uganda, Chibuli Secondary School. And it was so amazing. We took the children to the national park in my final year of the high school. And I felt that I wanted to be a vet who also works with wildlife. But during my vet school in London University, I got to work with wild chimpanzees in Budongo Forest under Professor Vernon Reynolds and mountain gorillas in Windy under Dr. Liz McPhee who was heading International Gorilla Conservation Program. And so after that, I wrote to the director of the National Parks and he was like, yeah, we want to hire a vet and you'd be great for us because tourism has just begun and we're concerned that tourists are gonna make gorillas sick. So that's how I ended up uh, being hired as the first wildlife vet of Uganda. <laughs> and I know that being a vet is notoriously difficult. It's a very long process. I think it's even longer than being a, a, a human doctor. Um, so how, how did you manage to get that support and that training? It's a very long training, as you say. <laughs> you know, most university degrees are just, uh, you know, three years. Ours was five years. I did mine in, the vet, in London University, Royal Vet College University of London. And on top of that, I also had to, um, on top of that, I had to do lots of practice in between because you have to see 17 weeks of seeing practice before you graduate. And, but I took the opportunity to do some of it in Uganda and whenever I'd come home on holiday. So I got a chance to work with chimps in the zoo, chimps in the wild, the gorillas, and also with vets at London Zoo, Whipsnade, Wild Animal Park, Twycross Zoo and Longleat Safari Park. So all that was very, very good for me. And um, yeah, and also with vets, you know, we are dealing with many different species. A medical doctor just deals with one. We're dealing yeah. with all kinds, from as tiny as a little lizard to as huge as an elephant. So yes, yeah, there's a lot of anatomy you have to learn, physiology and everything else. So it is a lot of learning, but it's very exciting. <laughs> and, and through the work that you were doing, it, you came about then setting up your organization, which um, is looking at conservation through public health. And for those who are watching back home that might not know what it is that you do and what your ethos is and what you stand for, can you talk to us a little bit about this and why you decided to focus on the lives and the livelihoods of the local people, which will then in turn help boost conservation efforts? We decided to set up conservation through public health um, based on experiences I had working in the Uganda Wildlife Authority. One of the very first diseases I had to deal with was a uh, fatal skin disease in the critically endangered mountain gorillas. At the time, the mountain gorillas were critically endangered. They're only about 650. And they called me and said, the gorillas are losing hair and developing white scaly skin. So I actually um, asked the vets in Rwanda who had had a vet project going for longer and with, with gorillas, and they said they had never seen it. And I asked a human doctor friend of mine, what is the most common skin disease in people? And she said, it's scabies. I was surprised because my training in the UK, you know, people never got scabies. It's a disease of people of who are poor and have poor hygiene. And of course, in the UK, being a developed country, it was highly unlikely to meet such people. People would sometimes get scabies occasionally from their dog or cat, but it was just a temporary infection. And so she explained that the poor hygiene leads to this. 
I kind of hoped it would be scabies because with ringworm, you have to give, you know, somebody treatment every day, you know, a cream on your body for many, many weeks. Imagine having to do that with a wild animal. Yeah. So I was thinking if it's scabies, at least we can give one dose of ivermectin and they'll get better. And when we got there, the symptoms looked exactly like sarcoptic mange or scabies in dogs and cats. I was with a vet, Dr. Richard Cook, who had seen something similar in cheetahs in Masai Mara, mm -hmm. especially those that had been visited by many tourists and they were stressed. Mm -hmm. So together on that very day, actually, when we went trekking to check on that group, there was vets from America, Dr. Eric Miller from St. Louis Zoo and his partner, who's a very good small animal vet. And so she was like, this looks just like, we asked them to join us in the intervention. And so it looked just like scabies. We treated them, treated the baby, um, treated the gorillas in the group. And the next day, unfortunately, the mom dropped the baby because the baby was almost dead, actually, by the time we got there. And when we did the post-mortem, we found very, 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 very many mites. And we were able to prove that it came from people. And so a few years later, everyone said, well, you know, people can, gorillas can also pick up other diseases from people. You know, they got it when they went into people's gardens to eat their banana plants and mm -hmm. they came across dirty clothing on scarecrows. And so everyone was like, the gorillas can also pick other things as well. You know, like there's open defecation, people don't cover their rubbish heaps. So they turned to me being the only vet in the organization to develop a health education program. Well, as the only one who had that kind of training, being a vet and the rest were conservationists. So that was the turning point in my life because by the time I finished developing that program and we met with 1,000 people in eight villages where gorillas always come out. And I went with the community conservation warden and ranger. And I also went with the district health people, people who deal with community health. And by the end of it, I had learned so much about public health and I felt that it was important to set up an organization that can improve the health of the people and the gorillas together. Because I was shocked to find that people didn't get health care. Yeah. They didn't want to make the gorillas sick because many of them were benefiting from tourism, gorilla tourism. And, you know, they just had very simple requests, which were very practical. And so I convinced my husband and another founder who's a vet technician working for the Ministry of Agriculture. And we started conservation through public health. And so, I mean, you, you, you've touched on it um, quite a lot there as well. Um, what what has been the benefits from your organisation? So have you seen any increases in um, people getting, obviously, access to better health care, but then on the same signs, um, wanting to protect the, the, the gorillas? Yeah, we've seen a lot of great outcomes from the programme, which we're really pleased about. When we started conservation through public health, obviously it was one of those organizations that many people didn't fully understand, you know, because it was a new way of approaching conservation. So we set up three integrated programs, wildlife health monitoring, where we monitor the health of the gorillas rather than only waiting until they're sick. We regularly collect samples from their night nests and also when they're abnormal. And then we compare with what we're seeing in people and the livestock around the park. And then we, help to set up community-based health care. So we basically strengthen people who go to people's homes to talk about good health and hygiene and family planning. And we also teach them to do conservation outreach. So the dangers of eating bushmeat, the dangers of grazing next to, um, the, the dangers of, uh, you know, people making gorillas sick, you know, how easy it is to make gorillas sick and why we need to be healthy and hygienic. They talk about so many things, why they shouldn't cut trees and, you know, poach animals, and all of this really helps. And then the third program, which we decided to develop later, when we found that many people are unhealthy because they're poor, is because we found that it was very important to also support community livelihoods. Other NGOs were focusing on livelihoods and not health, but there are certain components of livelihoods that they were not focusing on. And so in conservation through public health, we found that over time, the people are, as community health improves, and hygiene especially, you know, there's less diseases. So we've only had one other scabies outbreak that was at the beginning in 2002 in another gorilla group that was before CTPH had actually begun. We had one other scabies outbreak, um, but we've also had, um, we haven't had any other scabies outbreaks since the organization began. Gr much less jadia in the gorillas, much less disease in the gorillas as community health improves, which we're very pleased about. And we've also found that a lot of people are now in family planning, which is something that, 
yeah. we decided to do when I realized that people were having too many children. Some of them were having 10 kids, not because they wanted to, but because they didn't know how to access family planning products and services. And because there are lots of myths and misconceptions that if you take it, something bad may happen to your body. And so we were able to engage with them and get them to understand that it's important so that they can reduce poverty in their home. But also they have less need to enter the park to poach and collect firewood because they have fewer mouths to feed. So it fitted very well within our integrated conservation and public health model. And so we've had more family planning uptake in the area where we work. It was less than the country average and it's now above the country average and the women are totally liberated. They're happy that they don't have to have a baby every year and they can do something else with their lives. <laughs> and the children are going to get a much better future because they can manage them. And so those are the impacts we've seen. But one of them I'm very pleased about is, you know, before when gorillas would go to people's gardens, people would be much less tolerant. But since we started our program, if gorillas go into people's gardens, they are more willing to call out the human gorilla conflict team that has gorillas back when they come out. Yeah. And there's one of them, Ruhendeza, who was the first silverback for the first tourist group in Buindi when he decided to settle on community land, when he became too old to follow the rest of the group. We educated our village health and conservation teams who go out to the communities to tell them that, you know, Ruhendeza would rather stay in community land. Can they look after him? And they did. And so when Ruhendeza died, they all came to pay their last respects. So there's been a, a huge amount of tolerance for wildlife and coexistence with wildlife just because we're improving community health. And uh, it's, it's improved even more when we started to com improve community livelihoods. <laughs> and I, I think that's something that a lot of people don't really think about in terms of conservation. There's so many little different aspects that you need to focus on. And people wouldn't necessarily think like um, that family planning would be one of them, but it, it plays yes. such a huge part, as you were talking about, you know, um, because they need to then support these children and, and that can then lead to poaching and things like that. Um, yeah. Going kind of back a little bit from what we were talking about, um, you are the first uh, Uganda wildlife vet. Congratulations and well done. Um, and traditionally, conservation doesn't usually, when they're normally a hands off when it comes to wildlife. Um, so they're like, okay, let nature take its course, um, don't get involved. But obviously you're doing, you're doing differently. Why is that necessary? And what kind of work are you having to do? Yeah, um, actually when we just, when I was hired as the first vet for the Wildlife Authority, the executive director saw why I was needed, but most of the people in the organization didn't. So <laughs> I spent a lot of time explaining why a vet is important. They were like, you know, if a warthog is sick, it's the next move for the lion. You know, why do you have to intervene? Um, they only really understood if it, if it was something like a snare injury, but they didn't think it was really needed. But because the mountain gorillas were so few in number, it was really important. We had really disrupted their habitat a lot. And to the extent that they were now picking up diseases from us once they became habituated for tourism and research and you could get really close. So it was a lot of educating that we have disrupted the environment of the wildlife enough that you know, the only way that the wildlife can bounce back is through veterinary intervention, which we have seen. Veterinary interventions have been, helped to increase the number of mountain gorillas, which is something we're all very proud about. And so, yeah, it, it was one of a lot of educating. But one thing that they also saw the value was translocating animals. For example, there were two elephants that were raiding people's crops and in a place where there was no national park. They were cut off between the migration route from one national park to the next through you know, building up in the area and they were in a small forest patch. And so the executive director was like, now we have a vet, instead of killing these elephants, let's move them. So I was like, it's very difficult to move elephants though. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and so I got, I got, so I learned how to do it. I went to Kenya and participated when they moved elephants from Savo, from Moya Reserve to Savo National Park. And then we moved elephants from Mubende to Queen Elizabeth and everyone was so excited. And then I got, they asked me to move giraffes from Kenya to Uganda because we had only five giraffes remaining in a national park with one female. So if anything happened to her, that would be the end of giraffes in Kidepo. So we brought three small giraffes that you could fly in an aeroplane just because at that time we couldn't drive because there's a lot of insecurity in the area with, you know, warriors armed with guns, you know, pastoralist warriors. So we flew them and within 15 years, the numbers had gone to over 35 
I was really, really happy. And so now, you know, the giraffe population is really growing there. So they began to see the importance of the kind of things we're doing. Um, and on top of doing the disease investigations as well. So with conservation through public health, actually good enough that when I left the organization, when I left the Wildlife Authority to go for further studies in North Carolina, I went to do a zoo medicine residency and a master's in specialized vet medicine. They replaced me, um, which was great. And so the person who replaced me continued what had started in the vet unit and other vets have also come in since then. And so with conservation through public health, I had noticed the gap. We thought, let's set up proactive systems for monitoring the health of the gorillas. So only, not only responding to emergencies in sick animals, but having proactive systems. So we put up a gorilla health and community conservation center at Windy, where we have a field laboratory where we regularly analyze the samples from the gorillas, not only waiting until they're sick, but we also analyze them you know, regularly so we can know when something's abnormal. You know, because before it was like, wow, we have a rectal prolapse. What caused it? Was it human related? Was it directly from the gorillas? I'll just treat the gorilla, do the surgery, the gorilla gets better. But we don't know if they're going to pick it up again because we didn't know what was the main cause. But now through our proactive monitoring of gorillas and other species, it's better. we're better able to set up an early warning system for disease outbreaks. Um, so yeah, I've built on that veterinary knowledge to set up conservation through public health. And also the fact that we carry out disease investigations, not only in the wildlife, but the people and the livestock who they closely interact with, means that we're using a One Health approach to conservation. And in that way, we're not only looking at the wildlife, but looking at all, everything else that can have an impact on the wildlife. And actually by improving the health of people and their livestock, you improve their attitudes to conservation. They're less likely to poach, collect firewood. And when you improve the health of the livestock, of course, not only do you reduce a threat of disease to the gorillas, but you know the production of the livestock increases and you also indirectly improve people's livelihoods. So it's kind of like a holistic approach to conservation where we was, which was based on veterinary principles. Yeah, I absolutely love the work that you do. It's like a full circle approach and basically everyone benefits. So it's like win-win. Um, we, ha we have a question coming through from Winnie. Hi, Winnie. Always lovely to see her. She's a regular watcher of the show. Um, and she's saying years ago, humans were asked to use masks when visiting gorillas. Is this still the case to prevent spreading diseases? Yes, it is. Actually, thanks a lot for that question, Winnie. Prior to the COVID pandemic, people could visit gorillas in Uganda and Rwanda, which has the largest number of tourists, as many as 40,000 per year before the pandemic, when they were not wearing masks. Could you believe it? You could get as close to seven meters, even closer, without wearing a mask, and it was okay. But when the pandemic began, um, our organization, Conservation Through Public Health, together with other conservation NGOs advocated to the government that everyone must wear masks because we were using masks to prevent COVID between people. Yeah. How could you not do it to prevent COVID from people to gorillas? And so the government immediately adopted this and it's hopefully going to continue even after the pandemic ends. So anyone who has to get any, to within 10 meters to the gorillas has to wear a mask, which is which is really helped to prevent them get picking up COVID from us because they were so used to being close to people. They're so accommodating and they don't know that there's COVID. So it's, it's just so easy for somebody to get very close to them. But with yeah. wearing of masks and increasing the distance that we view them, that has really made a big difference during the pandemic and yeah. protected. And I think people as well don't really understand that we share so much DNA with these animals that, and anything that we can get, they can get. And they also don't have that resistance to fight it because they've not had to deal with it before. So it can be a lot worse for them. Um, yeah. That kind of fits nicely into my next question, which is talking about the fact that you played actually a very key part in Uganda's response to COVID when it was like at the, at the peak time. Um, you know, you had a reduction in tourism. Tourism is incredibly important to the country. Um, and this led to an increase in poaching. Um, what issues were you seeing? How did you combat that? And then how did the government and yourselves work together? Yeah, it was a very scary time because not only were we concerned that the gorillas could pick up COVID from people, but we were also very concerned that people were going to start poaching because tourism had worked so well in Bwindi that the communities were really benefiting. 
you know, they had businesses, they could sell crafts, accommodation, food. Many of them were employed by the park, especially as porters who carry tourist luggage to the gorillas. They had become wholly dependent on tourism and had forgotten how to do other things before tour that they used to do before tourism, like farming. And so the pandemic was a huge, huge um, shock to the system. One way that we started off is by working with Ride for a Woman, which is a local group set up by a local lady entrepreneur, uh, Evelyn, with her husband, Dennis. They used to make tablecloths for tourists. And now with COVID, tourists were not coming. She was going to lay off all the women. We said, could you please make masks for the rangers and anyone else who needs to get close to the gorillas you know, during the lockdowns? And they did that, so they kept some people in business. And then we also have a gorilla conservation coffee social enterprise, which is our main, um, what I'd call our main livelihood activity that we do at Conservation Through Public Health, where we support the farmers bordering the park so that they don't have to poach and collect firewood um, because they're not getting a good price for good coffee. They actually have good coffee, but, you know, they were not part of the tourism industry and they were being they're not getting a proper, a fair market, a steady price. Um, and so we decided that we needed to start supporting them. And during the pandemic, of course, our main customers were the tourists and they were not coming, you know. So we were also stuck. But we managed to find distributors in the UK, Money Row Beans. In the US, we had already started working with Pangos, but they had run out of coffee just before the pandemic began. And in January 21, they bought more coffee. And through this way, we've been able to keep the farmers going. Vicky from Money Robins has placed around 10 orders since the pandemic began, which has been very important. It actually even happened. The second order she placed the day that the silverback gorilla, one of the groups was killed by a hungry bushmeat poacher who was not hunting gorillas, but was hunting diker and bush pigs. And he came across the gorilla and speared him because the gorilla charged when, you know, when he had the bush pig screaming that he speared. And so that was a very sad day. That group had to split up a bit because they were used to being led by a silverback and we realized that as long as people like that like him are around they're going to keep going into poach yes he was given 11 years in jail it's the longest anyone has ever been given for poaching a wild animal in uganda but as long as people are hungry they're going to keep going back and so we decided to start a program to provide fast growing seedlings to the local communities this was actually an idea that was came to me through mulago foundation where I was, I'm a Henry Arnold Fellow for Conservation. They were working with other development NGOs and they suggested this could be a good idea. The founder had visited us in Windy. And so we, we developed a program to, to give, you know, between one to four month seedlings that can grow very fast. It wasn't so much of a food relief, an immediate food relief, but it was more like a immediate and long term option and getting people to go back to what they used to do before gorilla tourism began, which is farming, but in a sustainable way. And then when tourism comes back, they don't use the money for food security, but instead they use the money for, you know, for school fees or something else. So, so far we've distributed seedlings to over 1,500 households, including the poacher's wife. She was only 22 years old with three children under the, under the age of three. So really, really struggling, really struggling. And we made sure that our village health and conservation teams reach her and talk to her about family planning. And we just felt that as long as you have those kind of people around, the wildlife was not going to be safe. Yeah. And so those are the kind of the ways we've tried to mitigate the impact of the COVID pandemic. And we've got a question coming through from Stacey. Hey, Stacey, she's based in the US and is a regular follower. Um, she's asking, during the lockdown without tourists, did the rangers notice a change in behavior of the gorillas? Um, during the lockdown without tourists, mm, there wasn't much change in behavior. Actually, what happened is when the rangers were going to the gorillas, we trained them a lot about don't get too close, you know, and when tourists come back, make sure they don't get too close. I would really say that maybe the gorillas are a bit surprised that people are not coming close to them anymore because I'm so used to people getting close to them. <laughs> and, and some people were surprised that if, the, if you wear a mask, you may, the gorillas may get scared, but actually they didn't. They were actually quite curious, you know, what are those human beings wearing? Because they're generally curious and very intelligent animals. So no, the gorilla behavior did not really change. Um, in fact, now that the tourists have come back, we're very concerned that, you know, the gorillas are thinking, okay, the tourists are back, we can get, it's okay for them to be close to us. So it's, sometimes you find that it's not the tourists or the rangers, break, it's not the tourists breaking the rules, it's the gorillas breaking the rules. And we're trying to <laughs> habituate them. <laughs> they didn't get 
forward and they shouldn't get closer than 10 meters. So now we're having to dehydrate them and say, you shouldn't get too close to people anymore. But yeah, so thankfully the behavior of the gorillas did not change much because what happened is that during the time when there were no tourists, the rangers had to visit the gorillas every day. Because the, the thing is, once you habituate gorillas, you have, you're committed to following them every single day of their lives, whether or not they're tourists. And that's why it's not good to actually habituate many groups that you're not sure you're going to have tourists for, because it's an expense. You have to pay the rangers every day and, you know, go to go on patrol. And you're not sure if you're going to have tourists, which is the situation that has happened during COVID. Basically, you know, there are no tourists. They had to follow all the 22 habituated gorilla groups. Yeah. And so, yeah, so, so no, the, the, the gorillas didn't become wary of people because they were being followed every day. It's just that they were probably wondering why aren't people getting as close as they used to before. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, it's funny the gorillas don't understand um, social distancing. Uh, <laughs> and we've got a question coming through from Lindsay. Hey, Lindsay. Um, I actually used to work with her many, many years ago. Lovely to see you here. And she is asking, um, when you only have a very small number of animals, um, for example, you were mentioning having to import three giraffes in order to increase the local population. Do you then have problems occur from not having a wider gene pool in terms of interbreeding? Yes, that's a great question. It's a very big worry, actually, the interbreeding issue. And going back to the giraffes, we brought in three from Kenya and the numbers went up. And of course, everybody was concerned that they're all from the same stock. You know, because actually, even shortly after we brought in the three from Kenya, and when the male got eaten by a lion, <laughs> very expensive meal. That was very heartbreaking, especially as I'd named those gorillas, I mean, named those three giraffes. Uh, it was heartbreaking to lose Hercules, who was the one who got eaten, but at least he was the male because we needed the females. And then um, the mother, the only female that was remaining, died in childbirth, giving birth to a girl the big female, and I was like, oh my God. But now with those two females and the remaining five males, the numbers really went up. And so later on in 2017, no, 2018, more giraffes were brought in from another part of Uganda where now it was safe to go by road, and that has increased the gene pool. With the mountain gorillas, it's very difficult. We really can't do much about it because there's only, well, the numbers have gone up from 650 to over 1,000, almost doubled over the past 25 years. But they're in two distinct populations. So Brindy has about half of them, just under half. The other half are in the Virungas. And these populations will never mix because there's so much, there's road infrastructure, building. They, they used to probably be together hundreds of years ago and they can never mix. And so in within them, you have inbreeding. You have things like partial syndactyly, fusion of the digits, which happens because of inbreeding. So unfortunately, there is quite a bit of inbreeding within the mountain gorillas and they don't help themselves any more because the, oh, it's only the head of the group who makes with the rest of the females when they move in a harem. Officially, it's the head of the group, but thankfully there is, we've seen cases where other ma males in the group mate with the females when he's not looking, which is helpful because <laughs> it helps the gene pool. But yeah, you're dealing with very small populations and how do you, you know, make sure that there's not so much inbreeding. I think the best way really is to keep making sure the numbers keep growing so that, you know, and the space for them keeps growing so that you have less and less inbreeding over time. Yeah, yeah I agree. Great question, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Um, now, I know from doing a bit of research on you and following some of the stuff that you've done previously, um, you're very passionate about the fact that there needs to be more local representation in conservation and also a lot more women involved in conservation. Why is there that lack and how can we change the dynamics and the attitude? Um, I would say that there's a lack of local involvement in conservation. I'll start off with that because a lot of people feel that it, it started off as something that came from outside Uganda and it's been the same in many countries in Africa. So when the national parks began in Uganda in the 1950s, it was all fences and fines. The local people were kept out yeah. and, you know, there were people were, they were, it was only about law enforcement. You're arrested for coming in the park illegally. You're not allowed to touch the animals. You aren't allowed to go to your cultural sites. And that's how it was. So it was always seen as a foreign idea. But over time, the community conservation movement began in the 1990s. 
And actually the wildlife, Uganda Wildlife Authority was at the forefront of this. My former supervisor, Dr. Arthur Mugisha, started the community conservation department in Uganda to engage communities in conservation. And now it's more of a move of let them become the champions of conservation. And we find that, you know, all over Africa, not just Uganda, there's very few leaders of conservation who are African from where the wildlife is found. And if you don't have those leaders, then when they have high positions in society, you know, let's say they become members of parliament, or positions that can make a difference for wildlife, they'll not make the right decisions because they've not really been nurtured into conservation. Or if they started in conservation, they moved on to something else because they weren't allowed to grow as leaders. So that's something that we're really trying to promote a lot of local champions. And that's why I'm, I'm one of the founder members of the African Primatological Society, which began in 2016 to build African leadership in primate conservation and research. The president is from Ivory Coast, where they have you know, even less wildlife and more poaching than Uganda. And we have people from all over the country, even as far as Madagascar on the committee. And we're seeing more and more leadership in conservation, but also even just getting children involved. My son over here <laughs> wrote this book when he was 13. Actually, no, he wrote it when he was 15 and 16, but he did this experience at the zoo when he was 13. And ever since he did it, we've had many more people coming for the behind the scenes experience at the Entebbe Zoo. So just getting more and more people involved at all ages, it can begin from a very young age. I know that my mom was the first sponsor of the Wildlife Club when she helped me to develop stickers. Then she came to Budongo, so the chimps came to Bwindi, so the gorillas, and has been a donor to our organization. So you can actually get your parents to become conservationists just by what you're doing. And that's why we are trying to do more things with children now. And then when it comes to women, just since I talked about my mom, <laughs> just wrote a book, My Life is But a Weaving, an autobiography um, about her life, where she has a picture of me when I took her to the gorillas as well. Um, and she is a women activist. She was one of the people who started the women's movement in Uganda. In general, in, in, in Africa, women are not encouraged to be leaders. It used to be like that. It changed a lot. But in the beginning, women were really it was very much a male-dominated society. But now, over time, people like her and many other women like her, she got many women involved in politics. And so now we have the largest representation of women in politics, among the largest in the world, with an extra seat for women. So the more that people start seeing female role models in leadership positions, it also in, in turn helps conservation as well. Um, and But with conservation specifically, another reason why women, and they're not very few in conservation, is because it's considered you know, be working in a remote area with dangerous wildlife is not considered to be a women's job. It's considered to be a man's job. And so, like when I started out, there were no female rangers. This was in 1996. And now it's 20% of female rangers, which is fantastic, you know, within the national parks. But it was like, no, women should just be sitting behind the desk, but not going out because it's too dangerous for them to go out. So just trying to break all those kind of stereotypes is really, really important. And I would say that because our model involves healthcare and women are normally seen as those who promote healthcare and men who promote conservation, we're able to have some gender equity. So we're having women more involved in conservation and natural resource management and men getting more involved in healthcare and family planning, which is really good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a founder member of Women for Environment Leadership Council, which basically tries to get more women leadership in conservation and on it we have people who uh, have started NGOs in different countries. Leila Haza is the one who initiated it. She started Lion Guardian, she's Egyptian, she works in Kenya. We have Winnie, Dr. Winnie Kuru, who started Conservation Kenya, she's Kenyan. We have Colin Begg, who works in Mozambique, and others who are working in different places within Kenya. And we have Rosette, who was, a, who was the first female director of the Rwanda National Parks many years ago, and now she's got a tour, tour company. So we're trying to mentor many women to, be, to realize their potential as leaders in conservation. And I think that will really make a huge difference to conservation, I have to say. I completely <laughs> agree. And I think as well by young girls seeing you actually out there doing it and actually living that life, they know that they too have got that option as well. It's not just something that's spoken about, it's, there is that reality. Yes. Um, we have a question coming through from Jason. Hey, Jason, great to see you again. And he is asking, have you seen a significant decrease in bushmeat consumption 
and improved hygiene since you, you started your outreach to communities? Uh, yes, we have, um, Jason. Thanks for that question. We've seen people are eating much less bushmeat because they're also understanding that the bushmeat can also make them sick, but they're also understanding why it's important to protect the wildlife because we're getting their local champions, their local community volunteers to educate them. It's not coming like from other people, but from their own people in their village. So that it's more convincing. And the hygiene has really gone up. The hand washing stations when we started were about 10% and now it's as high as 70% in some of the villages. And it even went up more even during COVID because they were concerned about picking up COVID from each other. Um, and yeah, you know, boost meat consumption has gone down. COVID kind of threatened it a bit because it went up again during COVID when people had nothing to eat. But now it's going back down again, thankfully. <laughs> and then we have another question coming through from Claudia. And she's asking, as you mentioned, the gorillas need more space. When the gorilla population is growing, how do you think this will be possible, thinking about the population pressure from people in the region? It's a, quite a big dilemma. <laughs> but because we are promoting family planning, um, it's, it's more like a short and a long term measure. The benefits short term and long term, that's going to reduce the population pressure in the long term. But um, as some of the people are like, you know, the more that they're educated on the importance of protecting the animals, and some of them are saying, look, the land that is directly bordering the park has a lot of wild, you know, human wildlife conflicts, a lot of animals come onto my land, not only gorillas, but baboons, which are even much more destructive, elephants, they don't like that. And they're like, we'd rather sell our land and stay somewhere else where our crops can grow. And also because they've learned the benefits, living around the park, they've seen how tourism has developed them, developed their communities and helped the country. Then they're more willing to say, okay, let me, you know, sell my land and stay somewhere else. So that's an area, that's something that we're really working on as conservation through public health to try and see how we can expand the national park. Because as the numbers of gorillas are growing, there's actually the human gorilla conflict is increasing, yeah. even as they're habituated, because now they're going out a lot more because there's less space inside the national park. Yeah, it's an ongoing issue, isn't it? Um, yes. one, of the, one of the things that um, I love about you is that you've, you've been doing such incredible work and you're very passionate about the work that you're doing. And you're in, as I said, you have this whole circle of involving the communities and things like that. Um, and I recommend anyone who's watching back home as well to, to go uh, to check out Dr. Gladys's website and pages. Um, there's lots of amazing information and fantastic work that she's doing. Um, you've also been recognized by the UN and also in the Tusk Awards. Um, so people are noticing the work that you're doing. Why do you think these kind of recognitions are important? Um, and do you think that it will help to kind of encourage others to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> I've been, thank you, I've been very honored and humbled to be recognized by United Nations Environment Programme, Champions of the Earth Award in Science and Innovation and Task Trust and other organizations. And it's really, first of all, it's encouraged me a lot um, and my team. And this recognition has also shown that what we're doing is working and it's shown a light on our unique approach to conservation, which is very important. It's also shown a light on other things such as the importance of empowering women to get engaged in conservation and to lead conservation efforts, you know, other or encouraging local people from where the, the animals are found to lead conservation efforts. There have been other kind of outcomes as a result of this, these awards. And I'm very, um, really, really greatly honored. And I hope that it will inspire other people to lead conservation efforts or anything else that they would like to do. Because I think awards are great at making people feel what inspires people, but also makes people feel that if you do something great and you follow your dreams, you can actually get recognized and inspire others. Yeah. 100%. I think as well, it's also a great way for other countries to learn about the work that you're doing and maybe try and take little bits of from what you're doing and, and try and put that into their conservation efforts as well. Have you, have you seen any cases of that? Yeah, yes, definitely. Like our One Health approach to conservation, we help to develop a a, poly, a strategy for the East African community, for all of them to you to have a population health environment approach, which is promoting community-based family planning and zoonotic disease prevention and good hygiene around protected areas. So I help them to write that poly that strategy um, because they love what we're doing. And during COVID, we have 
developed a policy brief for all the 21 countries that have great apes to adopt the same upgraded regulations, wearing masks and longer distance and making sure tourists support communities and also developing non-tourism dependent livelihoods. And this policy brief has been developed with International Guerrilla Conservation Program. We've written it together and it's part of the Africa CSO Biodiversity Alliance. And it will be launched hopefully in July this year at the first IUCN Africa Protected Area Congress. And there are 13 countries in Africa that have great ape tourism, both for gorillas and chimps. We're hoping that all of them will adopt these regulations and so that the great apes can continue to provide a lot of much needed revenue to sustain conservation efforts, but in a responsible way where their health is not compromised. For sure. Now you're talking about writing these documents and things like that. You're, I also know that you're writing a book at the minute. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what this is and if people are interested, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm uh, finally writing the book that I've been wanting to write for years and years. <laughs> when I left the Uganda Wildlife Authority, I thought I'm going to start, I'm going to write a book about setting up a vet unit in Uganda Wildlife Authority, but I got so busy and I never did. Then when we started conversations through public health, I'm like, I need to write the book. So finally, the book is almost ready and it's going to come out in October. Um, it's already been advertised on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And the book is really about my conservation journey as a woman. Um, I would say when I'm looking at, when I'm thinking about it, <laughs> you know, with talking about many of the things I've talked about, how, you know, I became a conservationist. And a lot of it actually started out because, you know, we, we had a lot happening in the country. My dad actually was a government minister in the previous government and he was one of the first people to be killed by Idi Amin. We remembered him last Sunday in a private ceremony at home. Um, and he was believed so much in developing the country, and then he was abducted, and so many were well, so many other prominent people after that. But I grew up thinking, you know, I want to continue his dream of developing the country, but through my passion for wildlife conservation, and that has always been a driving force in my life. And so, with setting up the wildlife clubs, and then setting up the vet department in the wildlife authority, then setting up conservation through public health and guerrilla conservation coffee, social enterprise. I talk about all of that and why it's important to, you know, to engage local people in conservation and why it's important to have holistic approaches and form partnerships with other groups outside the traditional conservation arena if we're going to be able to save all the animals on our planet. And so, so yeah, so it's, it's really my conservation journey, but also I do talk about the challenges of being a woman in the male dominated sector of conservation and you know what all, what all of that means and also trying to get more africans involved in conservation so hopefully people will enjoy reading it it's really focused a lot on my work with the gorillas but also other species as well and yeah it's called working with gorillas and it should be out in october i'll send you the link i, I look forward to it i 100 percent will be looking at that for sure um so Great if country. people are watching back home and they want to be able to support the work that you're doing, what's the best way for them to go about that? Well, that's great. They can visit our website. Um, on there, we have uh, a lot of ways where you can support our work, www.ctph.org, where they can sign up for an e-newsletter and get regular updates about what we're doing. They can give a donation. We have online donation platforms. They can come to Windy and volunteer with us or come and study, you do some research with us. There's so many things that we're doing and we need support in, you know, ranging from the work we do with the animals, the work we do with the people, the children in the schools. They can also, um, even if they're good at farming, they can also help in the Gorilla Conservation Coffee Social Enterprise. But people can also buy Gorilla Conservation Coffee um, in the various countries where they are. It's there in America, UK, New Zealand, Kenya, um, Australia, Canada soon. And so they can buy Gorilla Conservation Coffee. And if they visit www.gccoffee.org, they'll get more information, but it's also, they can also find it through the website. Um, and yeah, people can visit us if you have a chance, come and see the gorillas, learn about them. Because actually when you come, you provide sustainable financing for conservation, which can protect the gorillas. So all of these ways people can really support our work. And 
what are your hopes for the future? Um, what, what's your what's your thoughts for things going forward? What are you planning? Anything exciting in the in the in the loop? Yeah, well, um, my hopes for the future is that we continue to spread our impact. We definitely would love to, you know, make sure that numbers of the gorillas keep going up and there's more space for the mountain gorillas to grow. So that's something that is more like immediate, but a big hope for the future. We hope that there'll be many more local people all over Africa who are champions of conservation. Um, you know, stretch at the, when we held an African Primate Society conference in Uganda, which was the second one which I was heading because it was in Uganda. We had people from as far as Nigeria saying, we're gonna go back and tell people to protect the primates there because Uganda is benefiting from primate tourism. So just getting more and more people across the continent and across the world interested in conservation is something that's very important, but we'd like our model to spread in other countries in Africa where the gorillas and even people to adopt it in other places. Because the One Health approach is important in a savanna ecosystem, you know, to prevent disease between people, wildlife and livestock. And it's important in all kinds of ecosystems. And yeah, generally we'd love to spread our impact to more countries over the years and, you know, get more people engaged in conservation, have more local champions and have more women leaders in conservation and local leaders in conservation. I completely <laughs> agree. And as well, because those who are living locally, they're the ones living with the wildlife. They know the unique situation. It's not a one size fit all approach in conservation. It depends on the yes. area, the communities, all oh, there's so many different variants. So I think it's so important that, that these local voices then become the people that have the biggest voice rather than someone from outside coming in and trying to kind of fit an approach that they don't really understand. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so I've only got one more question left. We've had some lovely comments as we've been talking. Thank you so much to everyone watching back home. I've really appreciated it. Some really nice support. People watching from all around the world, which is always so incredible to see. Mm -hmm. If you have liked the show, please do give it a like, comment and share. The more people that see it, the more awareness we can raise for the organization and for the work that people are doing in conservation and hopefully inspire others to kind of support and join in as well. Um, so Dr. Gladys, I always like to end things in a positive note and I would love to know what your favorite success story was. <laughs> wow, we've had many success stories, um, <laughs> which is my favorite one. Hmm. <laughs> well, I would, I would say that, um, you know, I was really pleased that, you know, I, I don't know, I have, I have many, <laughs> I should, let me think about it. I'm just really <laughs> glad, like, for example, the we, there are people who I really get excited when, you know, people who used to be enemies of conservation are now saying that they now want to protect the wildlife. They want to go in as tourists. Yeah. That's a story which... I really, really like, which I'm really pleased about. I'm glad that when we had the scabies outbreak, as a result of it, we're able to set up an award-winning NGO, Conservation Through Public Health. And so that one incident, which seemed to be an isolated incident, has led to so many benefits for people and wildlife. Um, not only in Windy, where the incident happened, but in other parts of Uganda and in other parts of Africa, where many, many more people are adopting that One Health approach to conservation. Maybe that can sum up the success stories. No, it's true. And I think what's good is that you don't just write people off. You don't go, okay, they're a poacher, they're a bad person, that's it, they're done. You're like, okay, let's try and reform them. Let's try and make them positive. Let's try and get them on board. And I think that's, and given that a sustainable alternative livelihood, that's the only way forward. There's no point just keep putting people in prison because the problem doesn't go away. But by giving yeah. them an alternative, that's going to be the way to do it. So I think you're doing an incredible job. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And I hope to host you in Windy one day. <laughs> uh, I really hope so as well. Okay, so I'm going to start to wrap things up. Is there anything that you would like to say before we say goodbye? Um, I would say that and I would like to thank you all so much for listening and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn, and, you know, we would love to get your comments, feedback, and thank you for all the great support. <laughs>
No so thank you so much. As I say, I've absolutely loved having you on the show. We've had some awesome comments as we've been talking, lots of positivity, lots of support. Um, and as she said, do please go and follow them on social media. Um, you won't be disappointed. There's lots of lovely images and also some fantastic stories of the work that they're doing. So thank you everyone back home for tuning in. Really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. But from me, goodbye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathleen. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>